Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Sherry, and I am with the Michigan Community Service Commission. This is the first of our sessions on organizational effectiveness. We will be doing different sessions throughout the year to help really organize or help nonprofits be able to retain employees, to be able to uh, better meet employees' needs, and also uh, conform to many of the uh, practices that you will find in corporations that help them have a competitive edge. So some of these, with that being said, there is not a best practice, a one way to do things. And we at the commission certainly realize that every nonprofit organization is at their own level of development. So with that in mind, what we encourage you to do is to be able to take things step by step, but also to be able to um, realize that you can't you can't do everything all at once, and we understand that. So it's really just an introduction to these concepts. And um, with that, I'll continue to let people in the room. If you could try to minimize the background noise that you have, that would be great too. Okay, so with that, uh, this series is uh, underwritten by AmeriCorps, the agency, and Michigan has received what is called a volunteer investment grant. The idea behind that is that we are building the capacity of nonprofits across Michigan, ultimately to be able to better serve your communities. And we want you to be able to uh, utilize the gifts and the talents that volunteers bring. So all of these have an element of volunteerism uh, built into it. So with that, let's go to our next slide. Uh, here is our, oh yeah, here is our agenda. So today I promised that we would talk about culture. And we're going to talk about we're going to have you take a piece of paper. You're going to want to write some notes down, but you don't have to write the notes on the concepts. Um, what I want you to do is as we're going through exercises to think about how this, um, uh, you know, how this impacts you. And so we're going to talk about defining the culture that you want to work in and defining the culture and talking about the culture of your current organization. And then we're also going to really discuss the, um, the, the difference that culture makes for an organization. And then we'll also talk about employee engagement versus satisfaction. And what is the starting point for building a positive culture and defining what's important and then developing your plan. So we're going to go over, like I said, lots of concepts today, and I don't expect that you'll be an expert at the end, but I will certainly do my best to try to uh, introduce these concepts and we can support it with some learning tools that we'll send following this. Okay. So um, let's talk about what culture is. I took a few examples here. And I think that they're pretty good, pretty on point. So organizational culture is the system of shared values, beliefs, practices that characterize an organization and its employees. Now, I always like how Gallup defines it. It's just the way we do things around here. And the culture is also the unique way that your organization lives out its company's purpose and delivers on its brand promise to, to customers. And you might think, hey, well, I'm not a company. I'm, 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 a, I'm a nonprofit. Well, you still have customers and you still have a brand promise. And so this is very, very um, clear to what um, it's very meaningful to organizations. And sometimes one of the most important things an organization could do is really define what their culture is. Now, I will tell you, and I've said this in past trainings, um, culture eats process every day. You can't have a bad culture and have positive outcomes. It just doesn't work. So what is culture? I always have trouble with this. Let's see. Hmm. So as I look to forward my slide, um, what is the culture that you want to work in? And, you know, I would ask you if you'd like to um, come off a of mute and talk about what are some of the elements of culture that you want for yourself? What, is, what are some of those? What do they look like?
and I can help you if you want. Um, for many, what that looks like is employees that uh, your, your peers do their very best, they're supportive every day, uh, that the organization uh, expects the best of you and supports you in delivering the best that you can. Um, it's that people are kind to each other, people are kind to their customers, that you know who your customers are. And what does it feel like? Is there anyone else who wants to say something about that? <laughs> it's kind of hard, isn't it? Yeah. Well, oh, oh, go ahead. Mary. Yeah. So in our environment here, at the, we're a domestic violence shelter mm -hmm. and up in the Keweenaw Peninsula, basically. And uh, we're a small shelter. And, and so one of the things that we learn how to do best as staff and employees here and, and, our, and volunteers is learning how to say, mm-hmm. So we're always listening. We're in that listening mode, not in that telling mode. And and uh, always use, always try, I don't even like to use the word try, always not use, that doesn't make sense, not use the word still and again, because those are judgmental words. So um, we always encourage to refrain when they're writing up notes or phone calls or talking with our clients um, to refrain from using that that word, those okay. words. I appreciate that. I love that. And really what that what Mary is saying essentially is that her organization has defined behaviors that are supportive of their culture that they want to uh, create, that they're attempting to create, they're they're creating. And I love that, Mary. Anyone else? All right. Yes, I, for me, um, I really want to be part of a culture uh, where the individuals are warm yeah. and open and accepting. Perfect. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, and those elements of a culture are the things that are, later on you're going to see, they are drivers of employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction. Um, I worked in healthcare, you, I often talk about this, and those elements of, um, and, and Mary also this is very true in her line of work and, and probably many of yours, but people are dealing with an element of trauma in healthcare. They don't come to health. They very rarely come to healthcare for a positive thing, unless they're having a baby. And even that is very scary. So, uh, you know, when they walk through the halls and people ignore them, people are not, um, you know, they're, they're, they're lost. They're, you know, they're, they're looking for how do we, how do I fit in here? Is this a safe place for me? They're looking at all those things. And in Mary's situation, she perfectly explained it. When you're talking to a client, you don't, you, you don't want them to, to believe that you're being judgmental of them. And that judgmentalness, and as you're talking about having empathy and respect, uh, those are all things that are elements of a culture. So thank you. Um, have you ever experienced a bad culture? Have you ever experienced, um, I'm, I'm sure we all have, uh, I'm sure we all have, but um, I'm thinking about a time when I was, and I'm going to turn off my camera, my computer is saying that my uh, thing is unstable here. Okay, so um, I had a I had an experience when I was younger, and I really didn't know how to handle it very well. But I had um, I was in a culture where uh, people kind of talked about each other. They backstabbed. It happened with the leader. It happened with the um, frontline employees. And it was, it wasn't very safe. It didn't feel safe. So I think that is another element of it. And so when things, 
um, don't feel um, safe and they don't feel empathetic and they don't feel warm and you don't feel respected, uh, you can't bring the best that you can bring to work every day. So think about that. And then um, I am sure that I, as I recall in that situation, we never talked about the mission. We never talked about the vision. We never talked about the values of the organization. And quite frankly, I don't even know what they were, to be honest with you. But I have been in organizations where we were keenly aware of what the mission, vision, and values were. And what we did about that was that it was reinforced in all of our decisions as leaders. It was uh, expressed in lots of ways to employees and to um, all of our stakeholders. And then it was also um, it was also central to our behavior standards. And we went on and we adopted things like what our um, leadership promises, what our volunteer promises, what our um, you know, what our frontline, what what these values mean to a frontline person. And they were the ones, it wasn't done to them, it was done with them. What is it that these things mean? And how does it look in your everyday work? And that, what we heard from people is that that was so absolutely powerful. And what it did was it helped align people. And alignment is a huge piece of the culture. A culture cannot function well without alignment. And it can't function well if you um, if you don't have the right pieces in place. So with that, uh, let's see. So, oops, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not doing so great today on a few of these. So what does your organization's culture feel like? Can I pick on Mary again? Uh, Mary, if you want to come off of mute, I have a feeling that you have put some things into your culture. What does it feel like when you, what does it feel like when you interact with a coworker? Well, uh, I've, I've been at my agency for 32 years and so um, up until recent years, I mean, we, we had very little turnover. And so, you know, we've gotten together and I worked with people as their coworkers as well now as their director. I've only been director. I've been here for 32, but director since 2014. Okay. And, you know, there was a change that was, that was different for some people. So that was a little bit of a difficult transition. But now as new people are coming in, I mean, I always try to set a culture forward to them that you know my door is always open and I haven't had any staff that have like been disrespectful of that and just come barging in and whatever I mean they still are open and we have conversations because we all work with our clients you know we're a residential facility as well as outreach and you know I love it. You were saying some really great things. One thing that I really picked up is that you talk, you talk about your organization and what the expectation is uh, for interactions with your customer, who are your clients, who are your traumatized victims of domestic assault. Um, they definitely are people that need a lot of handholding. Um, there are certain elements of their brain that just do not function the same in a situation of trauma. And unfortunately, these individuals have experienced trauma over a long period of time, usually. So uh, you have a very special thing that you do for those, um, those individuals. My hat's off to you. My hat's also off to you because you're talking about the fact that you are having conversations and that you feel it. There's respect. Um, there's kindness that's shown to each other. And that is so, so valuable. What about other people? If you'd like to come off a mute. Can you repeat Hello? the question? Because yeah. I was waiting in the room and I didn't okay. get admitted. I missed some of it. Oh, I, it's okay. What does your organization's culture feel like? What does it feel like when um, 
you know, things get tough or what does it feel like? How do you treat each other? How, you know, how, like what's important when you're in a time of struggle? What is important when you, things are going really well? What are, what, what is the culture? What does it feel like though about the way you get things done around your organization? I can tell you some things that we have uh, uh, worked through uh, in, in this organization. I can tell you there is, there's a culture of speed and being uh, nimble and being um, proactive, but yet reactive and reactive in terms of disaster, for example. You can't just say, well, I'll get to it when I get to it. There are people that need your help now. Um, there are, uh, you know, there's things that are always coming up. There's a grant opportunity that could benefit organizations uh, like yours. And there is a sense of urgency on employees in this organization to say, and, and contractors, um, to say, you know, we want to be able to provide that service to nonprofits. There's somebody who could be helped. And we know at the end of the agency, there's a whole community that needs to be helped. So I would say like for us, a, a sense of urgency is something that is very um, important in our organization. Uh, I would also say a level of respect in the way we treat each other is also something else that's very important in our organization. We are all, um, we are all remote. And I can tell you that when you just work with somebody via email, you don't know like how that person feels or the, how that person is um, perceiving your message. So trying to make those one-on-one -on -one phone calls, those contacts, things like that, and then being sure how is it that you're supporting each other. The last thing I want to do is let down my coworker but sometimes um, because of that sense of urgency and other priorities that come in, that happens. What about your organizations? Very quiet team today. Well, I would like you to write down on a piece of paper a few things that you can think about about your culture and what does it feel like now i want you to keep something else in mind uh have you ever heard the that phrase uh perception equals deception and that was kind of a powerful thing for me and it kind of made me laugh a little bit because my perspective as a leader or um as a um as a volunteer may be very different from my perception as a client or as a family member of the client or as a donor, a supplier, a funder. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard for me as a contractor to understand this, but I, for example, have had always had great relationships with my funders. And I always put a special emphasis on that. But some organizations don't. And sometimes they're not always very respectful to their to a funder. And to me, I, I, I kind of shake my head a little bit at it because your funder should be your partner, not an adversary. And many, many times that's usually the way it is, yes. But when it's not, I always wonder about that culture. I wonder about that culture when I interact as a customer and I I see elements of poor culture there, things that I don't agree with. I tend not to want to go back, uh, things like that. When an employee isn't empowered to fix a situation for a customer, that's a, an element of, hmm, that culture may not be, if they're not empowered to do the right thing for the customer and to keep a customer, that always makes me wonder. But anyway, I want you to jot down a few of those things because this is going to help you as you're creating your own plan. Okay, so moving on if I can. So um, 
as I was saying, you know, how does your culture feel? It feels different to other people. And, and if you don't, you know, if you don't go out and ask, you don't know. And so my question to you would be, how I mean, do you ever go out and ask others like what they think of you, what they think of their interactions with you? Uh, not just you personally, but your organization. Have you do does anyone do that by chance? Such a quiet group. And I'm so sorry. I think that um yeah, I'll chime in, let you know that we're here. <laughs> um so when it comes to asking other people, I guess a good way to find out what other people think of our organization is by surveys. Yeah. Sometimes we'll have a survey in the community about the work we've done and we're going to do. Um, from time to time, it's just reviews that are offered about who we are and the work we're doing. And then we'll do a routine check in within our board, you know, just within an organizational level, administrative level to ask from one another, like, you know, check, you know, how we're doing personally, as well as how we're doing in our efforts to be contributors to the board. And we also check in, like, you know, our strengths, our weaknesses. So essentially, I'm a huge advocate in my leadership style of, style of checking with an assessment, assessing continuously. Perfect. And what is the name of your organization? She's a genius. Oh, I love that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I think that is genius. So thank you. Uh, that is wonderful. So what she's saying is that she looks to multiple stakeholders. She doesn't just rely on one piece of evidence to know, like, what are your opportunities? What are your strengths? Where, you know, where should you be placing your efforts? Um, so that's a, that's a good thing to keep in mind. And I love that. Thank you, Candice. And so why am I having such trouble today? So um, who does your organiz your culture impact? So Candace gave us some hints there. She has defined her stakeholders. My question to you is, have you defined all of your stakeholders? This is for everyone, not just Candace. But have you defined all of your stakeholders? Who are they? And you know, this answer when we, when our organization went through some uh, some assessments, the the answer to this question kind of surprised us. On one hand, suppliers were someone who they are a stakeholder. Uh, when I worked in a hospital, suppliers were a really big piece of making sure the hospital ran well. It's the it's the striker company, the people that make um, bandages, surgical equipment, um, all those suppliers, even like steel case because we bought furniture. And so defining who your stakeholders, that surprised me. And I thought to myself at first, why would why would I, when I'm their, their customer, why would that be a stakeholder? And um, I would encourage you to think about that because the stakeholders, they may be able to be a partner with you in improvement operations. If there's things that, you know, having that good relationship and to be able to um, bank on those relationships when you need it, uh, to be able to get a really good assessment of the, the what your what your relationship looks like how it can how that relationship with a supplier could for example be able to improve your overall operations I think is is a very powerful insight and I would say that I would look at um, sister organizations um, I'm going to go back to Mary I know like in the domestic violence world, there are a number of state associations, regional organizations, um, county level, multi-county level, police, uh, prosecutors. Those are all stakeholders in, in your shelter. And you might not always think about them being a primary customer or um, you know, a focal point, but those are people that you need to have really good relationships with. Uh, one, 
they they can be brand advocates for you instead of being um, adversaries. Uh, you're all working towards the same goal. They don't want to have a shelter in their community that cannot meet the needs of the people they're trying to help. So um, really doing this with your senior leadership team, your board is very important. Defining out, defining out who all of those stakeholders are, they would really probably surprise you if you really thought about it. And then how do you engage with them? Uh, I have to say that, you know what, we didn't really think about that in, in the beginning. Like, why would I engage with, you know, striker that much um, before? But then when, when, when we really got into it, we realized that we had this, we had some of the same goals. Um, striker, for example, who is a big medical company, if you didn't know already, sorry, but they have patient safety in mind. We have patient safety in mind. It's critical to our organization. And why was that so critical? Because we were taking care of your mom and dad. We were taking care of your children. We were taking care of your neighbors. We were taking care of our parents. We were taking care of our uh, the people that we care about. No one wants a patient getting hurt in a medical setting. And so when we engage with them to learn what all of the opportunities are that exist out there with their technology, with what they know, it's the, they're an expert in that. And then we could benefit from that expert knowledge. That's, that's, that's the power of that. And you know, having a culture that will take and um, will take impact, it will take suggestions and advice and direction and incorporate that into their improvement plan is, is really key. And then, you know, asking, like uh, Candace said, you know, for an honest assessment of the organization. You know, it's hard sometimes to hear that. And I know that there have been times in my own career, and I've seen this lots of times where people think that they know the answer and they're like, well, no, you know what? I mean, even though a customer gave us a bad review, it's really a gift. But at the time, maybe we didn't think it was a gift. We wanted to explain it away. We wanted to say, well, this is because of this. This is because of that. You know, um, this is because, um, no, I'm not saying that this is Mary, but I'm going to pick on Mary again. Uh, so Mary, please don't take any offense at this. If a client, a, a previous uh, resident said, you know what, it was a lousy place to live. Well, I would want to dig into that a little more. Why, what, what was it about it that was a lousy place to live? Was it, I could just assume that, you know, it was, it was my, um, it was maybe my perception that it was a bad time in her life. Of course, it's a bad time in her life. But through these bad times, that shelter may be able to help set her up for a wonderful future ahead, you know, a bright future that's where she's safe. Um, so digging into that more, what did that mean? Were other clients mean to her? Were other residents mean to her? Was it, you know, is there something like, you know, we had a lack of employment? I, I was stuck and it just, you know, I couldn't get past that. I didn't get the help I needed. Does that mean that, you know, may, maybe that's an opportunity for Mary and her team to be able to look at developing employment skills because being able to have financial freedom would be the key indicator to be able to get somebody moved into housing, uh, things like that. So think about what that is. Not all bad reviews are, are, are bad. They're a gift. And um, they are something that you can use to begin to help you move forward and have an honest assessment of what your organization is, the, the strength of your services, and really the overall impact. So I would add to your comments, seeing as how you 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 brought my name up. <laughs> yes. I will say that it's the funny and, and it's well, I don't mean funny for the mm -hmm. client, it's serious for them. The things that they get upset with is we do have a 10 o'clock curfew because it is a safe thing and it's just like what what good can happen after 10 o'clock, you know? Yeah. Um and and it's for the safety of everybody in the shelter. Maybe bigger shelters don't have that, but we do. We're only a 10 bed shelter. Um, and we only have one person here at a time overnight. We're here three, six, oh, every day of the year, 24 seven, you know, and, and, and the other one that 
people get upset with is that, you know, we won't let them out of smoke after the security system is. And, um, you know, those are the things that people get upset with us about. But I, I do have to say quickly that when you talk about engaging with people, uh, um, coffee is, you know, my, my blood type, basically. And <laughs> I'm, I can say that I have the best cup of coffee I have is sitting across from the kitchen table here at the shelter talking with a client. And it might be about something totally, totally different. Yeah. But I I also will say that I have coffee with everybody. Even there's a couple of people on this on this webinar that we meet maybe about every six weeks or so and have coffee um, together just in the morning to hash things out. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and we have a coalition all those people you talked about, all our stakeholders that we meet every other month for lunch, yeah. you know, I pay for it. And uh, we meet and talk about it. it's an hour and, and we hear from people in the community, a presentation every time. So someone's always talking about how we can help victims and even our batterers too. So it's a constant conversation going on all the time. Yeah. And I appreciate that you just said even the batterers. I mean, um, people can change. It takes help, but you know, you have to look at the entire problem and, and, and it, you have, I mean, I, I really appreciate that. I also appreciate what you said about coffee and having those little moments, whether it's with um, a peer, a colleague, um, some, a subordinate, a client, a customer, and having those relationships. Uh, those are important times. I mean, those are really important relationship builders and it builds trust. So the whole thing I'm trying to get at is the so what? So what about the culture? You know, the culture is the culture. There's nothing you could do with it. Well, there is. But what is it? It's it at the heart of it is engagement. Uh, and depending on how big your 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 organization is, you have you probably have employees or you have a team of a core team and that's engagement. Now you're going to maybe find this hard to believe, maybe not. But in every organization, believe it or not, there's the engaged group, there's the somewhat engaged, there's like a highly engaged group, there's, you know, okay, you know, right here in the middle, and then there's some actively disengaged. And if you look at this, this picture about who's sinking your boat, there are people, believe it or not, in your organization that are actively trying to sink the boat when other people are rowing. Isn't that hard to believe? But when, and, and it's going to happen in, a, in any organization. I'm not saying that, you know, for you to look at the three employees that you have and look at one of them and say, you're trying to sink the boat, you're trying to do this. But generally speaking, you do have people that are at various stages of their engagement. And engagement, culture is, is a measure of the engagement. It is the culture is what will eat any kind of process or any kind of improvement that you put forward if it's not in, in line and it's not focused on the right things. So um, you see employee engagement here. Think of employee engagement, especially in a nonprofit setting and depending on where you are in your growth and your development and your size of your organization, it may be focusing on employee engagement, it might be focusing on board engagement, it might be focusing on volunteer engagement. But those are all elements of um, who is sinking your boat and who's engaged, who's actively trying to push the boat forward. So are there any questions about that? I have a question, but not specifically in response to what you just said, but maybe you could respond to it later. Oh, sure, um, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm planning a gathering uh, with the people on my team and we're a teeny tiny nonprofit at, at our very, uh, at a very beginning stage. But I think it's just really important to know who we are in terms of our values and our principles and how we want that reflected in all of our relationships as early on as possible. And so, so we're going to get together and as a group talk about what do we want our va values and principles to be and how do we want those to show up 
for others to observe and experience. Mm -hmm. And I just, I wondered if you or anyone on the line um, has a resource for a workshop like this? I mean, I think that, you know, it'll be pretty easy to put together, but I'm just wondering, is there yeah. some kind of great document or resource yeah. that could guide us? Yes. And that is actually in some of the tools that I'm going to send you today. So oh, we're going to talk about it. So this is beautiful. Thank you. Okay, good. Well, I did want to just touch on one more thing about, um, I mean, I have lots to talk about in, in employee engagement and way the way that it um, shows up in the culture, the way that it shows up in um, your mission, vision, values, how that's reflected. But um, sometimes you hear about employee satisfaction. And I want to just define the difference between satisfaction and engagement. So satisfaction is what you give me. So I am satisfied with my insurance. I'm satisfied with my paycheck. I'm satisfied with the office accommodations. I'm satisfied between my work and um, whether I can work from home or whether I work in an office. I'm satisfied with the parking situation. Okay, those are, I'm satisfied with my computer. Um, engagement is what I invest. I, you know, feel a responsibility to the organization. I feel an intense responsibility to all of you who take these trainings. I feel an um, a strong, um, desire to bring my best to work every day because I know even though I don't necessarily see all the people that you see, I support you and you support the very fabric of organizations. You know, if you're married, you keep people alive. If you're, um, there's sometimes there's some people from hospice that join us. You're the people who lead people through the end of life process and you make the difference between it being really a traumatizing experience and uh, an experience that's sad, but supported and it's done with love. Uh, so uh, you do important work. The people that feed people, my gosh, I mean, you know, I, I fortunately have never gone hungry, but I've been worried about food. I've been worried about money at different points in my life. Maybe I didn't always, growing up on a farm, I didn't always have the food I wanted to eat. I didn't have Fritos, but I had good food to eat uh, because we grew it. Uh, not everybody experiences that. And so I know that I am supporting the work of the people who are taking care of the people that need us the most at the moment. So that is engagement. I mean, I'm not saying I'm the most engaged person in the world. I'm not trying to say that, but that's the difference of caring or not caring and where somebody is. If somebody is a highly engaged, they're looking at what they're what they're investing, what they can do for others. But an unengaged person or somewhere in the middle is looking at, well, you know, were you fair to me and my money? Were you, you know, did I, did I get the nicest computer? I want, you know, my, my ability to be able to work from home because, you know, this is just only what works best mm -hmm. for me versus being able to see it from both sides. Is that clear? Okay. So here's the question. Yep. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so who is the most influential person in an employee's work life? It's the one-up or the direct leader. And he or she has the biggest factor in determining an employee's engagement. But there's super easy ways to influence this. And um, as we go on, we're going to look at how many people have are familiar with the Gallup um, uh, Q12 questions. Uh, these are the Gallup organization. They're like the leader in uh, employee satisfaction surveys and engagement surveys. And they, they lead you from satisfaction to engagement, really. Uh, I've worked well with them for years, but um, I, I wanted to share these because I absolutely love these questions. And if you look at these, some of these I put in blue and you're probably like, well, why? Uh, there's some of these that are, um, indicators that lead to other things and that these are what those questions are. So I know what is expected of me at work. That's a really important question. And 
uh, you know, having clear expectations and, you know, knowing what's important in the organization and knowing how your daily work impacts that has a, is a significant driver to engagement. And in the last seven days, I have received recognition or praise for doing good work. That doesn't always have to come from the leader, but organizationally wise, what is that system for recognition and praise? And who are you giving it to? And is it fair? Um, I will say I used to always write thank you notes. And then, I mean, I wrote dozens of thank you notes, dozens a week and to volunteers, to my peers, things like that. And then I have to tell you, this is kind of funny and I don't know what this means about me, but then the organization caught on to this and I did it because I knew the impact of it. That's why I always did it. And I, it was personal to me about who I was. And then the organization put a quota on it. They said, you have to write at least four thank you notes a month. And at first I didn't think much of it. I was like, oh, whatever. And then I started getting these thank you notes and I could tell the difference whether it was sincere or whether it wasn't. And then my feeling about it was like, are you kidding me? I got a note one time, just thank you for coming to work. Okay, well, I come to work every day. And, um, you know, I, I felt like that was, and it came from a senior leader. I mean, I thought, you don't have anything else that you have invested in me enough that you could come around and find that out. It wasn't my direct leader or anything like that, but I thought that was really weird. So um, what I'm saying about this is recognition should be meaningful. It's something meaningful. If you don't know what that employee is doing, don't just say, thank you for breathing and, and being here. Hey, thanks for hanging around. Um, what I would say about this, this touches on things like um, leadership by fact, leadership by management, and walking around, I'm sorry, leadership by walking around. That you should really be, if you're an employee, if you're a leader, you should be engaging in your employees every single day. This is something that Mayo Clinic does. They put people in leadership positions and they still expect a really important leader to go out and meet with patients every single day and and to to hang you know to touch base with visitors and why is that it's because leaders need to be seen a leader isn't very effective if they're not seen so what if you're like in a situation like mine where i am here in my house and I work five days a week, sometimes more, always from my house. I don't physically see my leader. My leader calls me every single day. Um, she, I don't even know how she does it, to be honest with you, but we have meetings. She's always open for text. That's her right now. I'm going to flip my phone over. Uh, and so, um, and then she's really good about following up and recognition for doing good work. I just wanted to thank you, or I'm driving home from that um, board meeting. I just want to thank you for being there. You know, you, you did these things that I didn't even expect. You just saw it. And I just really appreciate it. That is awesome. And then I get praise from my peers. Our communications person is like, you know, I just wanted to tell you that, you know, you did, you know, we had a lot more, uh, um, grants for National Service Day. And I was just really impressed by that. And I wanted to thank you for that. Um, and so think about that and think about the models that you put forward to um, help each other re receive praise. This one, I have a best friend at work. You know what? I People laugh at this question, oh, wow. but this one Great. is all about I connections and people okay. having connections with others at work. Um, somebody had their hand up here. Oops. Oh, if they still do, it's okay. If you don't, that's okay too. Um, but I, you know, having a best friend at work. When oh, you have a you best, did you have something to say? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was like, where the hell is 23? But I just see it now. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
So, um, yep. So, um, I have a best friend at work. Um, the best friends look out for each other. I will be honest, like my best friend at work helped me stay on track. I'm terrible about, you know, emails and deadlines sometimes, not so much deadlines, but, you know, new information that comes out. Hey, did um, you read this? Thursday. Um, if somebody needs. I feel to- like it's going to rain in the morning on Thursday and it could be annoying, but I um, think ma'am? first we'll be able to. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, in the morning, Thursday. Oh, I'm going to mute everybody. Okay. Um, so sorry about that, everybody. Uh, so uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that um, a best friend at work is all about connections. And this is another one. In the last year, I've had opportunities uh, at work to learn and grow. So these things build on other things. Like, for example, in the last six months, someone has talked to me about my progress you know, always giving feedback. That's something that my leader is really, really good at. And it's something that I would always really work on with my team. And, you know, even difficult conversations are because I care and I would actually frame it that way. And it made it easier for me. It made it easier for them. And it was done with respect. Um, So even opportunities for uh, growth, it's about the progress and it doesn't have to be negative. Um, my associates or fellow employees are committed to doing great quality work. That's important. And then that kind of goes to, you know, if you have a best friend at work and you feel good about other people and you have the opportunity to give praise to them, those are the things that build on those. Uh, my supervisor is someone at work seems to care about me as a person. And, you know, some of those things are things like making sure that you are asking, like Mary said, she has coffee with people. I love that. Just having that coffee with someone, uh, you know, just, you know, what's, what's going on in your, um, in your work life, things like that. So these Q12 questions are really important. Okay. So when you're paying attention to those and you're, and I'm going to give you some tips in a follow-up um, tips and tools, how you can use those to have some honest conversations with your employees and then be able to, um, you know, have an action plan for improvement. Um, the culture is the cornerstone of the organization. So it's not without um, understanding that it, it, attracts and retains good talent in your organizations. It creates alignment for employees, which if you were looking at all of those Q12 questions, you can see where and how that all aligns. And then it creates a focus of engaged employees because they know what they're supposed to do. They know how they're supposed to interact. And then um, that has a downstream effect on performance. And Um, They talk about key performance indicators. I don't know how many of you have key performance indicators, but it's basically the things that get measured. And we're going to talk about this in a moment. And to the, 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 the lady that talked about their organization is just starting. This is where it really starts to get into the meat of the things that you'll, you'll want to focus on. So um, a culture can, can impact safety, compliance, innovation, diversity and inclusion, inclusion, high performance, and the strength of your organization. Uh, so to gain, so one of the things that is really important is that leaders really have to identify and measure and regularly monitor the things that are most important in the, in the organization's culture. And then to be able to understand the relationship between the culture and the most important uh, important performance metrics. So we're gonna, there's a little thing called KPIs, key performance indicators that we're gonna just briefly touch on. So what, oh gosh, what is this? Um, I am so sorry. Huh. I do not know what that key, that thing is doing there, but the key performance uh, uh, indicators, here's a couple of definitions, but what it is, is that they're quantifiable indicators of progress and um, they have a measurable result. 
what it does is it provides focus for strategic and operational improvement. Generally speaking, it's something you want to improve on or you want to maintain. So for example, you may say, Mary may say, I'm sorry, Mary, I keep, um, um, you know, uh, picking on you there. I'm not picking on you. I'm just uh, calling you out because I, I think that you have some really good things going on there. Uh, so your a key performance indicator for Mary may be things like how many times someone returns to the shelter, uh, how many times people are seeking help. Uh, there's also something called a leading and a lagging indicator, and that's the result. So a lagging would be, for example, how many times someone returns to the organization to seek help. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing, uh, but it, it could be because, you know, you don't want someone constantly in a state of being in an abusive relationship. But, you know, you understand that sometimes people do go back. And what are the reasons for that? You know, they're very well aware of many of the reasons and things like that. But um, another thing that may be um, a target for her is um, how many people are, um, are, you know, being supporters of that organization. You know, how is it being um, attended to in the community, how many, you know, the marketing element of it. We're, I'll give you some, some examples of all of these in just a little bit. And then I will also um, share some ways that you can express these key performance indicators to your team too. So, uh, but tracking and keeping track of those things are really important because that can tell how if these, if the things that you're working on are the most important and they're related to your mission, they also will help you make sure that you're, um, that you're staying on target and that it helps drive alignment amongst employees. So here's uh, just some things that are, are key to every a really good key performance indicator. An overall plan only has about five to seven key performance indicators. I can tell you, I have had leaders that came up with 45 of these, and you cannot focus on 45 <laughs> key performance indicators. It's just not possible. So what does a key performance indicator look like? Um, it has to be measurable and expressive measures. What that really means is measures that you can, um, that are easily expressed, like um, for a social media K performance indicator, how many, um, how many shares or mentions did the organization get? Um, things like that. Um, you know, for financial, it might be something like um, days funds, um, operational funds, how often, how long you could fund your organization if you didn't receive another dime after today. Uh, a target would be every KPI needs to have a target that matches your measure and the time period of your goal. Um, this is generally a numeric value that you're seeking to achieve. A data source, you need to have a clearly defined data source so there's no gray area in how each uh, key, key performance indicator is being tracked. And then the reporting. Sometimes, like I said, some of them are lagging, some of them are um, are leading. A lagging is sometimes you won't know for a long time what the result is, but you're still monitoring it and you're still working the strategic plan to it. Um, uh, you know, the goal is you're doing things that when you do get that score, it'll be better. We in, in, um, in sometimes there's things that are even a year old that are still key performance measures, but you won't know um, but you have to put like incremental things in to be able to see if you can push that number. So it's not a surprise at the end. And, um, but a good rule of thumb is that these should be reported monthly. And another thing that is a good thing to do is once your leadership develops those five to seven or less key performance indicators that employees themselves take a look at those and then they develop their own. And it might be for the programming area. It might be for the fund development. It might be for the communications area. So, but expressing these in their work is how you create alignment. 
So these are the things that you're going to track and you're going to live by for the next 12 months. Some things you might want to think about in terms of, you know, is there work that you have to push aside or it doesn't get the same level of, um, of attention that other things get? Uh, I will tell you an example in a, the volunteer management world, we had some events that we were doing and some of these events were not even for the volunteers. They were for another uh, group. And there was a time when that was taking up so much time that we couldn't focus on the recruitment and the retention that we needed and the onboarding things that we needed to um, really uh, solidify where where our satisfaction levels needed to be and with our engagement levels and filling our, our vacancies. So what is more important? And those are conversations that employees need to have with their one-up leaders, but their leaders need to be clear on what those five to seven core metrics are. Here's a couple of examples. Employee satisfaction or engagement. Uh, if you do an engagement survey, that would be probably a lagging. Uh, but you could do touch point or pulse surveys to, you know, find out like how is one element of this doing today. And um, if you look at those things like a best friend at work, those things that were in blue, those are some of the key things like tell me about who your best friend is at work. Tell me about them having those conversations. That could be a um, like one of those pulse uh, moments where you're just taking the temperature of like, how are we doing on this? And then it gets to the, the big score at the end when you can do a full satisfaction survey. For HR, a position fill rate, that could be something that is really important, especially in a nonprofit where we're hearing that there's a lot of positions that are open or just not, you know, you can't find the people to fill them. And, you know, it could be like, how many applicants are we getting per, um, per uh, you know, opening that we have? And then here's another one that I think is really important is the cost for hire. Not many people always know how much it takes to, um, to hire someone. And, you know, is that something that everybody should know? Um, it seems to me like it, it is because if your leaders knew that, then you would take more time and value the employees that you have. A financial one is, and I was trying to think of that term, but the day's cash on hand, like if you didn't get any more money after today, how many days can you be in business? Can you keep your doors open? Can you pay your employees? And then is that something that you should focus on? Um, the net profit margin, um, that's a leading indicator. Uh, you would know, right, that you could know. It's not like you have to know at the end of the year uh, what that is. Here's a few more. Uh, for social media, the percentage of growth in how many people are following you, uh, the mentions and the shares, the conversion rate for a call to action for, for content. Like if you um, do advocacy, you really want to know how effective your outreach is. And then um, your number of donors per ask. These are, I'm not saying you have to use any of these, but these are just a, a few examples. And then the length of time it takes to get into a program from a programming standpoint. We actually had one in our volunteer department about how long it takes from a volunteer to start their application process to be active. And we knew we had a problem uh, with our teen program at one point, and we realized it was our process. And after we looked at the whole thing and we asked people, so how could we speed that up? And um, uh, program costs over time, you know what? This could be that, you know, something happens and it's the costs are going up. Is it, a, are we cost sharing is, um, you know, what is it? You know, how can we keep costs down so we could do this? How about the um, program launch for offerings of products and client retention or completion, uh, success rate of clients or participants? Those could both be lagging indicators, but very key to the outcome of a uh, program. So you, I'll give you some more examples and a worksheet to help you with this. And then how does this impact your mission, vision, and values? Is your mission working for you? This is a question I would have. Does it guide the organization and decisions? 
Does it help define behavior? Does it define the cornerstone or the principles of what the organization, organization stands for? And how is it referenced or used within the organization? And you know what? Here's another one. Can your stakeholders express um, the relevance of the mission in their daily interactions? Uh, can, you know, that means like, um, that means things like the behaviors. We developed in an organization that I was with, uh, we really took a lot of time and focused a lot on our onboarding and our hiring process to align with the mission, vision, and values of the organization. We talked a lot about it in our orientation. We talked a lot about it in um, how we interact with those that we're caring for. We talked a lot about it in terms of going right down to defining behaviors, behaviors that are supportive of the mission, vision, and values, and, and those that are not. And so, um, you know, I, I think I can give you some examples. And the lady that asked about this, this is really key, is what are those behaviors that, that you are finding are important um, to being able to push the organization forward? Is it that sense of urgency? Is that that constant desire to be able to make sure that the end users who you know are the communities that you serve have the support that they need? Is, um, is, that, um, is that a defining value of yours, for example? And so um, I would ask you when you get this to think about these things and have a conversation with your staff, have a conversation with your leadership team and have a conversation with your board about these. It may be time and there's nothing wrong with addressing your organization about um, addressing the mission, vision, values about what it's doing for you. If you can't even remember or people don't know your mission, that's a problem. Uh, is your vision working for you? Does it describe a future state? Does it um, do decisions help you achieve the vision? Are you making decisions for the organization based on the vision of who you want to be? You've got to be moving towards something. And your KPIs are usually always something about improvement. Do your KPIs move the organization toward the vision? Or are you reacting to like, oh my gosh, I mean, are we going to be able to keep the door open tomorrow? Your vision allows you to forward future think. And, and being able to use that vision to be able to think about the future and put the words down that will help guide those conversations it's important and it may need to be done a couple of different times. <laughs> and it's okay that it changes throughout the life cycle of the organization too. And so how is it referenced and how is it used in the org? You know, uh, is, it, is it prominent? Is it on letterhead? Is it on, um, is it listed on your, um, is it printed on your walls? Is it clear to people what that is? Things like that to think about that. And then can your stakeholders express the relevance of their of the vision in, in their daily interactions? If you want to be known as preventing um, domestic violence, I'm going back to Mary. And uh, you know, that's the vision is that you're going to live in a world with no domestic violence. You've got to take care of, you've got to address the batterers, you've got to address mental illness. Do all those people that are supporting you, do your the decisions that you make and your board makes every day, are those the things that are, are the decisions that they're making, are they relevant to your vision and, and moving you forward? So then let's talk a minute about the values. The values, are they clear? Are they expressed? Are they clear about who we are, what we stand for? and how it should be the roadmap that tells an employee when they look at those, this is what's expected of me. This is not what's expected of me behavior-wise. This is not acceptable. So when, um, I think it was Courtney when she said, uh, she wants to, an environment and a culture that is warm and, um, and accepting and empathetic. 
those are those are clear. Those are values. We're we're empathetic. We um, we are respectful. We're trusted. Leaders do this. Um, employees do this. Board members do this. Um, you know, our support people do this. Our volunteers do this, and that's how they live out our values. And expressing those and working with those different groups of stakeholders to define the values, and you don't you don't necessarily you know your leadership can say what the values are, but it has to be articulated in a way at every level of the organization that you can create the alignment. Now, this is another one: when you're in tough times or a crisis. Where or how are your values discussed? What presence do they take? Um, there was something that I that was brought up in a in a meeting I was in one time, where they said, you know, when you're in trauma, and you know it's a tough day, sometimes the very first thing to get thrown out the window is kindness love and respect. You just put your head down and you do the work. You don't care how you get it done. Um, so you're not really tending to people. Uh, that is the time that you should never drop your values. When times get tough, just think, oh, forget it. We just got to get this done. We got to make what we got to do, whatever we got to do to do this. That's really the time when you need to take a look at, hmm, what are we doing here and, and how are we planning for our values and our mission to be present in what we do? Uh, I, I witnessed one time uh, the church that I attend, I attend a large Catholic church and we had an arson. And I remember the priest on TV and he's a wonderful man. And he said, you know what? These are the times when we come together and we pray for the person who did this. And he didn't care about the damage. He didn't care about, that's not what he talked about. He didn't talk about the effect of what this was going to mean that, you know, things were lost or, um, you know, he, he prayed for the fact that, that no one got hurt. He prayed for the fact that um, we want to put our arms around that person and understand why they were hurt and why that happened. And if it, like, if it was an intentional thing, or maybe it was an accident, I think they were pretty clear it was intentional, but um, that's, that's the value. It's the value of that you love and that you don't, that you don't promote hate. So, um, so can your stakeholders express the, re the relevance of your values in their daily interactions? And I'll give you some examples of how behaviors um, particularly related to volunteers, let's say, are but you can express them towards employees and things like that. And having those conversations, how do you have those conversations? I'll send you some information on that. And then uh, next, so if you're following along, I'm terrible at math, okay? This is not meant to be a, 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 a algebra problem, but if you're following along, a culture plus key performance indicators, plus your mission, vision, and values. When all of those are in alignment, you have good employee alignment. People know what there's, what's expected of them. They're able to bring their best to work every day, and they're able to do what they're supposed to do to move the organization forward. Now, when you have a culture that's negative, and you have KPIs that maybe are in sync or out of sync, but you also have an emission and vision values that are not all in sync with what those key performance indicators are. And it really is, it's disjointed from the culture that really does exist. It's a fractured system. So employees aren't gonna be able to do what they need to do. And whose responsibility is it to fix it? It starts with the senior leadership. But the alignment and clear expectations for everyone, uh, focus on engagement equals positive employee and stakeholder experiences. So keep that in mind. Uh, and then, you know, where do you go and how do you get started with this? The first thing is creating a plan. And I don't recommend that you just say, okay, I know what the problem is and this is what we're going to address. All too often, 
we many times think that we have we have the answer and you don't have the answer without data. And that's something that the key performance indicators help you with. You need to have a starting point and then you need to have a number that you're going to go up to that you're going to work towards and a goal you're going to work towards. And then what that's going to do, and it should be a stretch goal, by the way, but you have a plan, you start to put a plan. So you identify the problem and you explore the problem. I can give you a, just a quick example. I did this once and I could have kicked myself. I had a basement that kept flooding and I thought I knew what the problem was. And I told the plumber what the problem was. Well, the plumber was very nice and fixed what I told him to fix. Well, I'm not a plumber. And guess what? I didn't fix the problem. And as soon as he was done, every time I used the kitchen sink, I literally had a water feature in my basement. I am not kidding you. It was a water spout spouting out this big spout coming out of this fresh concrete in my basement. And I had a very beautiful water feature in the basement. No, not at all beautiful, very messy. I was very upset. I spent $4,000 fixing a problem I didn't actually fix. So I'll call him back out and um, I let him figure out what the problem was. So uh, my, my point is, is that he had to do some exploring to figure out what the problem was. I did my exploring, but I didn't listen to the right people. I thought I knew what the problem was. Well, he was happy to fix what I thought the problem was. That wasn't the real problem. So look at all your stakeholders and do, do the work that we suggested. And I will give you a worksheet that will help you with this and spend a lot of the time in planning. So identifying the problems. And then um, when you, you're going to come up with some strategies to potentially uh, be solutions, do them and then check the results. Are you getting closer? Uh, in, you know, this is all a part of learning. It's okay to fail. And if it, if it's not working, you go back and you, you uh, implement other, you adjust your, your process and you act on those. And then you go, then you, um, then you do it again. And so you check the results, you make some changes, you act on those changes, you track your progress, and then you continue planning. So this is a flywheel that really never ends, as you can see, plan, do, check, act. And it's always a good thing to keep this in mind because, again, a lot of times we, we think we know what the solution is, like me and my $4,000 plumbing problem. So uh, where should you start? Well, the first thing I would say is gather your senior leaders. The, these could be your board members. It could, if you're in a large organization, gather those large, um, gather those leaders. Be intentional about what elements of the culture need changing. And, you know, and you need to explore that from different perspectives. Uh, you know, saying that, you know, I think where you start is you just have a conversation that if we're having problems, we need to, to have a solution to these problems, but we're not the only ones to figure it out. We can't move this organization forward without all of our stakeholders. And then what you should do is you should, if you don't do an employee satisfaction now or uh, engagement, you should look at those Q12 questions. You don't have to have uh, the Gallup survey, but you can use those questions and the research from Gallup to help drive those conversations forward. And direct leaders should have conversations with the employees, with the volunteers, with the stakeholders uh, about those um, Q12 questions where it makes sense. Now, I don't think that a um, a supplier to you is going to have a best friend at work. I don't think that's an appropriate thing. But, you know, engaging in the how can we help each other? These are the challenges that we're having. This is the way we need to move. You know, this is what we want to achieve. How can you help us? These are our key performance indicators. These are the things that we're going to focus on this year. How can you help us? That's an appropriate, uh, an appropriate conversation to have with like a supplier or a, you know, outside customer. But for employees, you know, asking those questions, people who having have um, friends at work that are engaged, you know, what, what does that look like? 
And does it mean that, you know, you have to spend every weekend with that person? No, but you know, my best friend at work, I never saw them outside of work. Uh, but my, my best friend at work, doesn't even live in the state of Michigan. So I've actually never seen her here, <laughs> but um, but we work very closely together. And those elements of the best friend, um, you know, we always check in in each other. Hey, how you doing? What's going on with this? What's going on with that? And how we can support each other. So have those conversations and then have the conversations about recognition. No one has ever said, that I'm aware of. I've just had way too much recognition. I've had way too much praise. It's just too much. It's just, I'm, I'm over it. No one has said that. Uh, so how can you plan those things? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what people have done uh, to support recognition in their, in their organization. And then looking at your mission, vision, and values and start thinking about how it's helping your organization grow, or does it need to be adjusted? And do you have key performance indicators? If you can think about those, what would they be if you don't have them? What kind of uh, things will help your organization grow? Uh, what will create improvement? What will create more stability for the organization? And then how do they align with all stakeholders? And what strategies can you use to align the stakeholders around KPIs? And I'll give you some, some hints on that with, um, with the, um, the tools. So I know I muted everybody and I kind of started going really fast here. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody. And um, oh, I'm going to try to unmute everybody. Okay, I think I think I kind of did there. Um, so I'm going to send you a planning guide. I'm going to send you the questions and I'm going to use some engagement. I'm going to send you some engagement tip sheets and conversation starters. And then um, I'm going to send you some more examples of KPIs and some dashboards that uh, we've used in the past. And then review um, I, um, some ideas for creating alignment at all levels. And then I'll, and I'll send you some mission, vision, value examples. Uh, anyone have any comments or questions? Um, is this clear? Is was this helpful as an as like just a, a as like you know touching base on these things? It, don't expect in an hour that we're going to be able to make you all experts, but does it give you a little something to help plan for for your organization? Or do you Hi. use these? Yes. Hi, this is Rossanne Bucci. Um, Hi, Rossanne. Yeah, there there was a lot of value here, a lot to take in all at once, of course. Well, of course, um, yes. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you would be willing to give us your email address that we could possibly follow up with a, a question for you. Yes, actually, that is my next slide. Oh, you're so good. <laughs> um, yes, there it is. Oh, um, wonderful. Yeah, and you know, I don't expect that... Um, I really don't expect that anyone is going to be an expert after hearing this kind of informational download. I'm always concerned with how people are hearing the information and assimilating the information. I'm not the most perfect presenter, but what I try to do is I try to follow up with lessons that you can reference back to, tools that you can reference back to, and then you can pull what you need from them. And I'm always here if you have questions. Anyone else? Thank you, Rossanne. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. I just wanted to say this is really helpful. This is Eddie DeGraw. I'm from Circle Pine Center. Um, we have a lot of a very dynamic uh, culture here. We have people who live on our campus and work together. So there's a lot more levels of uh, interaction. So I, I'm really looking forward um, to bringing a lot of these best practices to our culture. Oh, good. And you know, I didn't even touch on the fact that uh, the we have five different uh, generations in our workforce these days. And depending on, you know, how, you know, how, who your organization engages with, uh, that culture might even, I mean, it, it, culture goes so deep, you know, you might have a lot of different um, ethnicities, you might have people that 
weren't even born in this country that you're supporting that are a, a stakeholder and they have, you know, different cultural um, importances, you know, uh, uh, traits, um, things like that. So this is a really complicated topic, really. And the key that the thing that is the the equal denominator is that you include people. It's all about inclusion. Yeah. So good luck. Good luck to you. And if I can help, let me know. Anyone else? Any burning questions or was there something I didn't answer for you? Or at least touch on? Well, okay then. I'll stay around for a couple of minutes, but I wanted to let you know, um, I appreciate all of you for being here. This is, um, the work that you do is so incredibly important to residents across the state. And I was truly uh, genuine in what I said that that is the, my role is to help you in your organization be a better organization um, once, you know, you've turned it over to someone else's hands or um, I've, you know, went away from this role. If there's something I can do to help you grow as a leader, I certainly always hear. And um, I'm not always the content expert, but I will, I learn from a lot of you too. So if you have an opportunity to share something great with me, please do. I'm always open for that. And um, that you know, again, just expressing that the services that we can provide for you uh, really are always meant to be um, responsive to the needs that you have. And if there's something that you need more, please, please, please just always reach out. So um, I'll let you uh, get back to your day and I'll work on getting these things out. But like I said, I'll hang around if anyone has any uh, questions. So thank you everyone for being here today.